thank you very much everyone for joining. We've got quite a number of attendees, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, I was going to make reference to this being Friday the 13th, but I don't want to set any uh, unnecessary worries about procurement and the fact that we're doing our first webinar of 2023 on Friday the 13th. Um, but Happy New Year to everyone as well. Um, it's going to be a really exciting year for procurement. Um, I know that all of us that work in procurement every day always think that procurement is exciting, um, but this is a year which we are genuinely going to um, be making some progress um, and we want to share that with you all today. So firstly, by way of introductions, um, my name is Lindsay Maguire. I am the Head of Engagement and Deputy Policy um, Lead for the Procurement Bill. Um, my role involves um, working with a whole range of uh, stakeholders across the whole of the public sector, parliamentarians, um, peers, to try and put the Procurement Bill um, through the House of Par Houses of Parliament. I'll be joined by my colleagues um, Freya Skilton, who is the Head of Learning and Development for the Transforming Public Procurement Programme, and Stephen Cowburn, who is the Project Manager for the Digital Element of the Programme. Um, so next slide, please, Amelia. Great, so what we wanted to do today, as I say, it's our first webinar of 2023, and it's a really important opportunity for us to give everyone an update of where we are. I want to go through the programme in general, piecing some of the elements together. I'll talk a bit about the benefits, a bit about the parliamentary journey, talk about a few key topics of interest, um, but also I want to give a bit of a flavour of what this actually means for procurements themselves. So to date, we've been very much talking about policy areas, ideas, legislation, but we're now at the moment where we're starting to bring some of our ideas to life, which we want to share in this platform. I'll then pass over to my colleague Freya, who will talk about our learning and development offer and what that means for contracting authorities. And we'll give you a bit of an update on the digital platform. And Stephen's going to talk through some next steps on how we want to engage with the digital process as part of the programme. We will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, next slide. What I wanted to do firstly was just to really put our procurement reform programme on one slide for everyone. So there's a couple of moving parts, um, but also it is a huge programme. And one of the things we've always been really clear about within Cabinet Office is the policy and the legislation, the procurement bill itself, all of the really detailed things that we're going through at the moment is very much only one part of what we're doing. We also want to underpin this with a series of very effective learning and development for contracting authorities. We want to look at our digital transformation, build a platform, build centralised systems in order to actually embed and enable the reforms. Those are really important parts of this. And alongside that, we also have a, a governance stream which will be rolled out through the procurement review unit. And we are going to be working very closely with contracting authorities on planning and preparation for implementation, which I will talk about a bit at the end. And that includes things like processes, systems, people, what you can do to prepare for this change which is coming. So that in a nutshell is the procurement reform programme. Cabinet Office has funding available for various different elements. And whilst we're focused on the policy bit at the moment, and you may have seen some press about the procurement bill and there's lots of political debate going on about it. There's an awful lot of work happening in the background around learning and development platforms, systems, which actually which we want um, to change. So next slide. So firstly, I just want to I just want to clarify what our benefits are for the UK. Our ministers have been describing this as a once in a generation change, which is uh, quite exciting. But obviously, it's really important that we get it right. But we also communicate the benefits quite widely. So we really want to reduce the overall volume of legislation streamline everything that we're doing, have everything related to procurement in one place so that it's really clear for contracting authorities, for suppliers, for lawyers, what the legislative baseline is. And this includes taking the defence regs, the concession regs and combining everything into one. And that's really, really important. We also, however, want to use this as an opportunity to drive innovation in what we're doing. So commercial procedures that we're all very useful, used to, they serve a purpose, but we have got an opportunity to drive that flexibility and by association, bring a bit more innovation. 
We also want to embed transparency. Um, this is a really key theme of everything we're doing. We learned some hard lessons during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we want to make sure that we are uh, demonstrating to taxpayers how we are effectively spending and managing public money. And this is really important, and it's an important goal for everyone, including ourselves as taxpayers. We also want to make it easier for businesses to do uh, business with the public sector. So we've been very focused on our benefits for the contracting authorities, but actually we need to recognise that this is a huge opportunity for UK industry as well. And we want to do some work with suppliers in order to share messages and make sure that the opportunity is understood and that businesses are equipped to maximise what they can do on that. So with that in mind, next slide. We very recently pulled together a, a handy guide to the procurement bill for suppliers. Uh, I understand that wading through pages of legislation is not always the most uh, the easiest of things, and there are certain things which are embedded in legal language which might not be fully, you know, understood in the real world, which is completely understandable. So this guide basically sets out um, why this is a good thing for suppliers and why we, as Cabinet Office, think that this will encourage new entrants into the public sector. And it's a core theme that's been running out throughout all of our policy development. So as I've mentioned, the new flexible procedures will definitely mean better procurement outcomes. So if we can use learning and development to upskill our people, to focus on innovation, to really think about how we're doing procurement, that's going to create an opportunity. We also want to strengthen the way that we work with the market ahead of any procurements. So can we do better engagement? Um, can we be clearer around the parameters on some of that engagement, which will help smaller businesses and social enterprises who may not have been alive to some of the opportunities out there? As I've mentioned, transparency, the digital platform and how we're embedding the systems are going to be absolutely critical. We're aiming to have all information in one place, including visibility of upcoming pipelines. So we will be legislating that contracting authorities will need to embed those pipelines so that small businesses and any business can identify exactly what opportunities are coming up in their areas. We also want to develop a tell us once system, which will save lots of hours in repeatedly filling out bids on different public sector systems. And we'll be working through what that means in terms of integrating that into existing e-senders. And my colleague Stephen is going to talk about that in a bit more detail when we go through the digital process. Um, and finally, we've done some really good tactical things. You know, we've strengthened prompt payment provisions so that 30 day payment terms will be the absolute default throughout the supply chain um, and we've strengthened the way that we're going to give suppliers feedback. So if suppliers are unsuccessful in a bid, you'll have all of the feedback that you need in order to change up your offer, look at where you went wrong and actually feel about how you, you can kind of like, you know, develop your business going forward. So I want to be really key that this is an opportunity not just for the public sector, it's also an opportunity for our suppliers out there, particularly small suppliers, but all suppliers should see some of the benefits going forward. Next slide. So where are we now? Well, we've had a very fun eight months taking the procurement bill through the House of Lords. We started in May 2022, uh, which is when we last held one of these webinars. And since then, we've gone through all stages in the House of Lords, culminating with a final third reading at the end of December. The procurement bill had, uh, I think in total, about 38 hours of live debate with peers. So that just goes to show just how important procurement is, but also how big some of the topics are that we are discussing in these contexts. So a lot of the feedback from the peers and a lot of the debate, um, it was not necessarily about the technicality of how procurement functions. It was more around what procurement's role is in terms of enabling wider policy. So we had lots of debates around principles, net zero. Um, there was lots of debate about specific sectors. So engaging on surveillance technology, for example, um, what this means for a global supply resilience market. And those are huge issues. And obviously we've had to pitch the procurement bill um, in a way which it will form the baseline of legislation for everything from schools buying stationery to the MOD buying 
uh, you know, complex infrastructure and military equipment. So the procurement bill itself is the framework. What we do in policy and how we move this forward is going to be really important. And that's why we've cemented the national procurement policy statement within the legislation itself. And that's how we're going to manage our strategic priorities for procurement. Following all of that debate in the House of Lords, there were some changes, there were some amendments which I'll come to on in a minute. We are now in the House of Commons where we start the process all over again. We had a very detailed debate on Monday, which was three hours, where the opposition uh, set out their you know, expectations, their challenges, their goals. Um, and we will now go into a detailed committee process whereby each member of the committee will go through things clause by clause. And that's the real chunk of parliamentary you know, scrutiny and progress. Everything's updated online so you can have a look, see who's interested. You can watch the debates, you can read everything that we've published um, to get a flavour on how the, the procurement bill is actually being viewed in the political process. So let me just talk about some of the changes. If you skip to the next slide. So these were all changes that were made at the end of the, the process of the House of Lords uh, in response to strong feeling from peers, but also in response to some of our own policy developments. So one of the things that we realised when we published the bill was that uh, the definition of procurement is very wide and it was becoming a bit confusing as to what was a regular procurement, not necessarily covered by a public contract, not necessarily in the public domain, but it also could cover some of the things such as exclusions. Now, this is a really technical point, but legally it could have been a, a bit of a problem down the line. So we've introduced a new concept of a covered procurement. And what that effectively means is that any procurement, any public contract, which is done by a contracting authority, will be a covered procurement. There are some exceptions, things like if it's below thresholds, for example, but the covered procurement is now the terminology which really sort of sets out what we mean when we're actually doing the procurement bill. We also uh, took stock of an overwhelming depth of feeling around small businesses and how we can do more to support them. Obviously, this is always going to be a bit of a challenge in the context of fair treatment and in the context of our trade agreements, which we have with uh, treaty states uh, suppliers. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, include or what we have done is include a specific duty very, very early in the bill on contracting authorities, which says when you are procuring, you have to have regard to small and medium ent enterprises with respect to what you're doing in your bid. Now, Obviously, there are going to be certain procurements which are never going to be suitable for small businesses, and that is reality. You know, we work on some complex infrastructure, but where there are ones which are in the middle, this is a really good opportunity for contracting authorities just to check in, make sure that their bids are proportionate, make sure they're not putting too much onus on the marketplace and are not unnecessarily excluding small businesses. And by putting this on the face of legislation, we really wanted to send a message of how important this is for contracting authorities to take into account. Alongside that, we've done some very, very practical elements which will make it easier for those small businesses. So we have uh, made sure that contracting authorities can take into account audited accounts, for example, uh, where they're not needed. So sometimes small businesses don't need to have those audited accounts. There are different processes um, and we want to make that clear. We also want to make it clear that things like insurance um, should only really be in place once a contract's been awarded. Uh, so there shouldn't be any additional costs for small businesses to have insurance on a framework, for example. And that's all set out in legislation and they are all mechanisms which we've had direct feedback from small businesses before. Another thing we've done is we've looked at the thresholds uh, relating to transparency, um, particularly relating to the publication of actual contracts themselves, the production of KPIs for a contract and the production of contract change notice contract updates. We've moved the threshold from two million to five million. And what that means effectively is if you have a contract over five million, you will be required to publish the contract in full, notwithstanding a level of reduction. Um, but for anything under five million, there won't be a legislative requirement to publish that contract. This was in direct feedback to some of the concerns around what this would place, uh, you know, burdens on quite transactional contracts um, within the wider public sector. So we think it's a good measure. Um, and we do think that that is uh, going to be uh, beneficial for contracting authorities going forward.
and five million is around about the right point where things start to become very very complex and the taxpayer would you know would want to have visibility of that um, and then just finally um, we've included an amendment which will actually include the central digital platform on the face of legislation so this seems like a minor point but it's actually optically very important previously we'd said we'd commit to doing that in the future actually we've said it's in legislation now so that puts a bind on what we're doing the central platform will be an inte integral part of, of of what we're doing and uh, and that's in the legislation so those are the key changes um if you just like, skip on to the next slide There are some important things just to note uh, throughout the whole process. Um, we are um, really pleased that the Welsh Government and Northern Ireland have um, agreed to join the bill and they are drafted in the bill as is. Um, there may be some difference in implementation and rollout and requirements. All of that we will work through when we look at the uh, general implementation for the UK as a whole. Um, the Scottish Government is going to continue with its existing regulations, which is very much how it how it works now. But we are working closely with Scotland on some topics such as cross border procurements. Um, we expect more changes. It's a parliamentary process. You'll see how much the bill has changed through the, the last eight months. Um, so we are expecting more in the Commons. Uh, we won't know exactly what the final, final version is going to be until the, the end. However, I will say that the majority of the focus from politicians at the moment is on big issues uh, relating to uh, global resilience macro issues rather than the specifics of the, the mechanisms of the procurements itself. So for contracting authorities who are trying to get to grips uh, with those mechanisms, they are unlikely to change. But obviously we are at the behest of Parliament, so we will see what happens over the next few months. And then secondary legislation, as I've mentioned before, this is going to be a significant part of how we actually embed the regime, transparency notices, things like CPV codes, um, things like regulations for, for frameworks. These are all things which will sit in secondary legislation and we will have a big package of that. We are aiming to do a level of consultation and engagement on that later on in the year um, and we will work very closely with yourselves and use our communications channels to make sure that we're getting the right level of feedback for that secondary legislation ahead of it going live. Next slide. So that's all the really technical parliamentary bit. What I also wanted to do just before I hand over to um, my colleagues to talk about L&D and digital platform is just put up a slide to give you a bit of a flavour as to what new flexibility actually means. So we've been talking about it, uh, you know, often we've been sharing it widely. We've been posting about it. We've been talking about it in the house. But what does it actually mean? So what I've done is I've put together this uh, sort of route way for a procurement. So in essence, a contracting authority could have a new idea or they need a new service in any sector, tech um, or something, you know, a new building or or something related to construction. Um, what we would encourage them to do is engage with the market. And we've put parameters around that pre-market engagement. Um, then when they go out to tender, there'll be an opportunity to design what that procurement looks like. And that could mean including a shortlist for suppliers based on product demonstrations. So if it's a, a brand new tech thing, if it's cybersecurity or a new add on for something which is relatively new, you as a contracting authority would be able to do uh, a product demonstration and actually use that as a shortlist. Once you've come up with your shortlist of ideas and suppliers, you can then put that into a negotiation process. You can invite best and final offers and then negotiate those best and final offers until you actually reach an agreement and something which works both from the product side and the price side. And then following it all through, you would then publish your notices, you would do your standstill as now, and then you would do your contract award. Now, obviously, this is not going to be suitable for every single type of procurement. There are still many, many procurements which are uh, transactional price driven, very much suited to the open procedure. But this is just to give you a flavour of if you are working on something particularly complex, um, new, exciting, there is going to be so many more opportunities to actually design that end to end procurement, which will meet the needs for the marketplace, but hopefully also lead to a bit more innovation, better outcomes, better spending, etc. 
these these type of examples and what we are working on in terms of guidance will form a very important part of implementation and the learning and development, which Freya will talk about in a minute. I just wanted to set that out as a as a quick flavour, but there'll be much more of this to come. And we are looking at specific model scenarios in how this would work in particular, you know, different sectors and how we can best communicate that with the marketplace and yourselves as contracting authorities. Next slide. So I'm sure after all of that, um, you will have a burning question about timelines. Um, Whilst we're in Parliament, it's still quite difficult to pin down exactly when this is going to be going live. Uh, I wish I could because it would make my job an awful lot easier, uh, but unfortunately we are still waiting for, for Parliament to give that ratification. What we think, if everything goes to plan, things should be finished in Parliament by the spring. We then have to do our secondary legislation. And we've already committed to having a six month implementation period where we will start the delivery of the L&D programme and work with contracting authorities on their implementation. So those of you with a keen eye on what that means for timescales, uh, what we are saying to contracting authorities and suppliers at the moment is this is going to be early 2024 at the earliest. We will continue working with Parliament, we will continue working with our directors and our ministers here and aim to come up with slightly more concrete date, which we can then communicate through our channels. But we don't think this is going to be a 2023 go live because of the bulk of secondary legislation, but also because of the, the importance that we're putting onto the learning and development. So early 2024 at the earliest. Um, it may be later, but we will certainly be communicating that quite widely as soon as we can. Next slide. Great. Well, that was just a bit of a whistle stop overview of some of the parliamentary bits and timelines. I'm going to pass over to my colleague Freya Skilton now, who is going to talk through the learning and development offer um, and what that means for yourselves going forward. Thank you. Over to Freya. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, good morning. Hello. I'm, as Lindsay said, for Skilton. Um, I'm going to talk through the um, learning and development element of the TPP programme. If you would like to move the slide for me, please. Excellent. So fully funded places on our learning and development courses are being made available. So they are free at the point of delivery, which I'm sure you'll be really pleased to know. Um, and the reason for this, I think Lin, um, Lindsay's touched on it, but we recognise that the learning and development is an essential part of the TPP programme implementation. It underpins the cultural and behavioural changes that we really want to see and which will be key for you to unlock the flexibilities of the new regime. So what is in the L&D package, as we like to call it? It's a portfolio of products. It's aimed at different audiences and meeting a range of professional requirements. So starting with those who only need a, a you know, a very general overview. Um, I'm not quite there yet on, on that, that slide, Amelia. So um, uh, yeah, so starting with those who only need a general overview, um, moving through to um, more detailed and specific instruction on the new regime for practitioners um, in central government and contracting authorities, and through to an intensive deep dive learning for key personnel. Um, the package will comprise of four elements or we like to call them products, which we which will be underpinned by published online written guidance um, and other materials. All the specifics on these um, and the details uh, that I'm sure you will want to know um, and information can be found on the TPP landing page. Um, but I'm briefly going to run through the four elements or products now. So if you'd like to move um, on Amelia, thank you. So the first one is knowledge drops. These are open to everyone. Pre-recorded videos that give a generic high level overview of the changes and they'll provide some material understanding of the new regime. They're not detailed, they're between maybe 30 and 40 minutes and they'll be hosted on the government campus and YouTube. They're a useful introduction for those professionals who want to go on and access more detailed learning. 
as, as um, you can see through the programme. So alongside the um, knowledge drops for contracting authorities, we're also developing um, a couple of short briefing product videos, about five minutes for senior leaders and executives. And um, that'll help them understand what's coming down the track. We're also um, producing two specific tailored versions for suppliers. So that's knowledge drop tailored versions for suppliers um, uh, in general, small, medium businesses and the VCSE community. We're working with business organisations and trade bodies, etc., to ensure that we get the content right for this widely accessible overview product. The second part of the portfolio is the um, self-guided e-learning and written guidance, the one in orange on the slide here. These are designed to be the core of our training products. There's nine modules and one assessment module. So yes, you'll be taking an exam um, that will provide skilled commercial practitioners with a grounding in each element of the new regulations. They are built around the commercial life cycle for context um, and, and it gives a really nice feel to the journey through those modules. After completion of the modules, together with assessment, a certificate and an e-badge is awarded. Um, <clears throat> there, will be there will be specific tailored content that addresses different regulatory details, you know, such as defence, utilities, whales, light touch, those kind of things. Um, we're, we're really aware that, that there are some specifics around those areas. And we really want to encourage um, all contracting authority staff who have commercial procurement aspects to your roles or their roles to access the e-learning. The third part of the portfolio is the advanced course of deep dives. So these really build on the what of the e-learning. You can't access these unless you've done the e-learning, but they focus on the how for those who, uh, who need to become real expert practitioners in the new regime. So they are for key staff. They're three consecutive days of intensive virtual classroom delivery. We realise not everybody will want or need to invest the time in these sessions. So the places are limited, but it's important, but it's really important that we get the right people to access these. We already have a, a, a really good network of SPOCs, as in single point of contacts and super users to help ensure that collectively we reach those who really need this level of detail as far as the deep dives are concerned. Having said that, I don't want to um, uh, create panic around getting places. The places will be available over a 48 week period for these deep dives. So there's not really any need to rush at the moment um, because uh, they are uh, late in the in the um, L&D schedule, launch schedule, and it gives us all time to make sure that we get attendees right for these advanced courses. The last one, um, but by no means least, is um, the community's practice. These will be events managed and run in the community um, <clears throat> that provide opportunities for groups to come together and foster collaborative learning by sharing best practice, looking at the innovative approaches that, that you've been using, that people have been using, and the challenges of operating within the new regime. So if you could um, give the next slide, please. So we think that um, this is what the, the learner pathways are gonna look like. Um, generic overview, knowledge drop, open to all. Um, <clears throat> quite a lot of people we, we, we would hope would access that. If you're a skilled practitioner, you would we would want you to access the knowledge drop, build on that knowledge and then work through the online e-learning certification. Um, you may want to underpin that learning with communities of practice. And then as an expert practitioner, we would expect you to um, look at the knowledge drop, then maybe um, 
do the online um, learning with certification and the advanced course of deep dives and also underpin that with communities of practice. So you do the whole journey for an expert, uh, an expert practitioner. OK, moving on. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a huge amount of uh, detail and information on our landing page. So that's the um, transforming public procurement landing page. There is um, separate uh, PDF um, information around each of the products that I talked about, but there's also a lot more information in this document, getting ready for the new procurement act, which will help you plan and prepare um, uh, to be able to uh, access and make the most of the learning and development. So um, I'm now going to um, hand over to my colleague Stephen, who's going to talk to you about a really exciting part of the um, programme, uh, the digital platform. Thanks ever so much, Freya. Um, yes, hello everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Cowburn and I am the project manager on the Transforic transparency platform project and I just want to spend a few minutes during this session talking to you about the work we're doing to deliver the transparency platform. If you could just move on that would be great. Thank you. So just to set the scene, uh, many of you will recall that the Green Paper in December 2020 made a strong commitment to embedding transparency at the heart of the procurement process. It also committed to simplifying the digital landscape. For example, we have Finder Tender and we have Contracts Finder, which are both central, but then they are still split. So we have low value opportunities on Contracts Finder, high value opportunities on Finder Tender. And the Green Paper talked about effectively bringing those together so that both low and high value opportunities and information will be available in one place. The Green Paper also talked about, and this was very well received, about introducing tell us once functionality, which my colleagues have mentioned before. This will enable suppliers to store and share common information about their organisation, which is needed when they bid for opportunities. I'll touch a little bit more on this um, later on in the slide set. Next slide, please. So what is the transfer transparency platform? Well, to deliver the ambition set out in the green paper, simply put, we will be enhancing the existing finder tender service with some new functionality that will enable contracting authorities to publish the new notices and for suppliers to engage in those new opportunities. It will also handle the existing notices. They won't go away. Contracting authorities will have obligations to finish existing and in-train procurement under the current legislation. And in addition to building functionality to handle the new notice regime, FTS will also be enhanced to include new analytics tools, a better user interface and enhanced data outputs. Can we just move on? Next slide, please, Amelia. And just to help complete the picture, when we talk about the transparency platform, it's not a completely new service, as I've said. We're not building a third site to add to Finder Tender and Contracts Finder. We're enhancing um, Finder Tender. It's also not public procurement gateway or buyer and supplier information. These are terms that you might have heard before. The platform project is dependent on these services for successful supplier registration and for sharing of information as part of Tell Us Once. But these are separate services being built and maintained by our Crown Commercial Services service colleagues. This is much in the same way the existing registration of use of contracts finder and finder tender is done through the supplier registration service SRS. Again, this is a separate service. Now the ambition is that when we put all of these things together, the user journey is such that when you leave FTS to register to input information, it is seamless and you shouldn't realise when you've left FTS and gone to another service. It's also worth restating that FTS, the transparency platform, is not an in-procurement system. It's a noticing system, the front door, as it were, by which suppliers can look for opportunities or the public can look at information or download the data outputs to do their own analysis. All of the actual activity, for example, the procurement activity, the evaluation or, or award, 
happens on contra contracting authorities, local services, and we will be providing technical information to e-senders so they can integrate this into their services. This means contracting authorities will continue to share the information with FTS as they do presently. Next slide, please. Can we move on, please, Amelia? Great, thank you. So the approach we are taking to enhance FTS and build the functionality that is needed to deliver the new legislative re requirements is that we're focusing on the new noticing. These are going to be contracting authorities, new legal ob obligations from Rules Day. We're focusing on the notices that will be needed for day one of the new regime. These are going to be, for example, the pipeline and planning, pre-market engagement, opportunity and award notices. For launch, we're not focusing on the types of notices that contracting authorities will need six, eight or even nine months down the line, say to record KPI or spend information and the things needed for the post award contract management elements of the new noticing requirements that will come post launch because these won't be needed on day one and there won't be information to put into them on day one. These will be introduced later on so that contracting authorities can comply as and when they are ready to do so. As a result of the new notices, we need to make improvements to the user interface on FTS. This includes a new search function and an updated site design to help people navigate through the new notices and also to help everyone understand what, what has been left under the new regime versus things left under the old regime and to help manage expectations as to what data that should be available. And we're also working on the functionality with our commercial team. This is around the identifiers and drawing through information from their services that will allow us to ultimately put together visualisation on, for example, spend information when we have that data and the supplier register, the register of commercial tools, etc. that I've mentioned earlier. But as I said, the key messages are that we're focusing on the notices and functionality that are needed for day one before anything else. And then the post award requirements will be delivered later on. Next slide, please. So what are we doing right now with the notices? Well, we're working very closely with colleagues throughout the cabinet office to define the requirements and making sure that the legal and policy requirements work with the technology standpoint or work from the technology standpoint. When those requirements are defined and finalised, we are mapping across to the open contracting data standard. Those familiar with the green paper may recall that this was a key tenant of what we wanted to achieve as part of the transparency chapter and make our compliance with OCDS much greater than it is currently. I mentioned already that we're effectively splitting our development approach into two phases. Phase one is the notice, notices needed for day one, plus the enhanced user interface functionality. Phase two, those post award notices and the application of spend data and providing analytics, etc. All of this is dependent on the legal definition work, which is incredibly complex and detailed. Once it completes, we will have a much clearer picture of requirements and be able to understand the development profile and plan we need, which will feed into the programme's overall delivery plan. Next slide, please. So to facilitate all of this, we're having conversations with the e-senders. Those conversations are already ongoing, accepting that at the moment they're quite high level because we don't have the definition work finished and we don't have a lot of technical information that we can share. But we are talking around what the requirements are. Then we will be able to provide them with more detailed technical information. And we've already got a separate test environment set up for them to use when we have the first batch of notices and technical information to share. We hope at the moment that, that we will be able to do this in late May of this year, subject to the definition work. This will be the first batch of notices and we will start working with them in terms of onboarding, testing and identifying any problems and making tweaks to the services that we build. 
Once the first batch is live for testing, we'll be looking to share new batches of notices and functionality on a roughly quarterly basis and allow the e-senders to build out new functionality into their services so that ultimately when rule day comes, all of the e-senders are ready to go. Next slide, please. So just bringing things together, I just want to give you an overview of what I've talked about, and here is our high level roadmap. As I said, we're busy working with colleagues to define the notices, and that work is in progress, ongoing and near completion. We have started to build the phase one notices based on the definition work that has been done to date, but that will continue to be iterated as the requirements are firmed up. We will start our phase two development work as we come to the end of phase one, and we continue to test and do user research throughout our process. Work on the user interface functionality will follow after we've done the first batch of notices and the integration of that tell us once functionality will come later in the year. Next slide, please. Are we okay to move on, Amelia? It's probably just taking time to come through. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I just want to finish by saying a little bit more on the Tell Us Once approach. As I mentioned, this is being delivered by Crown Commercial Colleagues through their two products, Public Procurement Gateway and Buyer and Supplier Information. PPG is going to be around user registration and sign-on. It will be where organisations are issued with a bespoke reference number known as the PPON number, and it will also be where some basic information about them is stored. As part of this, individual users will be matched to their organisation, making it clearer than at present who is associated with which organisation through the process. With the buyer and supplier information element, this is the evidence locker functionality. Once people have registered, their organisation will be able to store their common information that is used all the time so that it can be shared and reused rather than having to keep re-inputting into it. I've come to the end of my section of the presentation. I hope that has helpfully given you a clearer picture of the transparency platform work. Thank you for listening and I'll now hand back to Lindsay um, for the next set of slides. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Stephen and Freya. That was that was really helpful. Let me just give you a bit of an overview of what you can do now to prepare and this actually might answer some of the questions that are coming through. Um, so what we're saying is uh, right now you know make sure you understand your current processes for procurement. Um, are your procedures robust? Um, do you understand how your market engagement works? Um, supplier evaluation? I'm sure absolutely everyone does this is just an opportunity to look at your processes and procedures in the context of change which is coming. As Stephen mentioned, you know, the digital change is quite a big part of this. Um, so you can help us by making sure that your e-sender knows that change is coming. We have posted the link to the landing page and everything in the Slido. It might be a bit difficult to, to find, but if you search for Chris Kirby, um, he's posted it in there so everyone should have a copy. Um, flag that to your e-senders. There's also the opportunity to volunteer for some testing. That's on the FTS homepage. Um, this is all about how we use the system, but also familiarising yourself with what's what the transparency ambition says, what the, the notices will look like, what's in the bill, understanding the parameters of that transparency programme will be super helpful. Next slide. So with people and L&D, as Freya mentioned, we've got a very detailed L&D offer, which we've published. Again, it's in that link. Um, think about who in your organisation will need to attend the, trend, the training. As Freya mentioned, we've got um, funded places um, and we have uh, in most sectors and organisations uh, a kind of a dedicated single point of contact for that. So um, if you don't know who that is, um, you know, make contact with them, find out what their plans are. If, if we don't have one specific, then drop us a line, I'll give you our email afterwards. 
um, but also consider the procurement and contract management capability generally across the organisation. There are quite a few tools out there which might be of, of help to this. So the government commercial standards, for example, um, the national procurement strategy. There's lots of ways that you can have a look and see where your uh, organisation sits in terms of its capability and, uh, and capacity. And that will be important to understand who needs to go on the training and how the training is going to impact your organisation. Next slide. And then finally, um, we really want to prepare for a smooth transition. We understand that, uh, you know, in in times when resources can be quite stretched and, and things are quite challenging, that transformation isn't always uh, welcome and, and positive. Um, so what we want to do is make sure you have everything that you need in terms of our communications, our guidance um, and what the Cabinet Office can do to support um, everyone in this journey. Um, so what we're recommending now is if you do a review of your pipelines to identify you know, what your planned procurements are. Um, you could potentially see if there's anything new, exciting coming up you know, around about the timescales I gave early 24, which might be a good you know, test case for the new um, regime. Um, look at your contract registers, uh, you know, identify if there's anything which is going to be expiring around that time, uh, where there's an opportunity, but also engage with your supply chain. So as I've mentioned throughout the presentation, this is a this is a good opportunity for UK industry as well. And um, so suppliers are, you know, coming with us on this journey. So the more that you engage with them, share links with them, let them know what's what's coming up, um, the, the better everyone will be in terms of preparation. Uh, we have got a lot of uh, guidance and everything that we've already published, but we're also going to be doing an awful lot more. So implementation is a very key part of this um, and sessions such as this one and conferences and subsequent work that we'll be doing will all be tailored to making sure that contracting authorities have got what they need um, to effectively manage this transformation and change. I've put our email down there um, as well in case anyone's got very specific questions, um, but that was it from us. Um, it's half level. I'm conscious we could probably have gone on for another half an hour, but no one needs that much uh, uh, procurement on a on a Friday. Um, so I'll leave it there uh, and please feel free to get in contact and I'm sure we'll be engaging, um, you know, some point in the future. Uh, thanks very much for your participation, everyone. Uh, really appreciate it.